Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're looking at the pivotal role that philanthropy plays in strengthening and uplifting communities with our special guest, Stephen Maislin, uh, President and CEO of the Greater Houston Community Foundation, and Andrea Mays, uh, the Greater Commun- Houston Community Foundation's Senior Director of Charitable Solutions. So thank you both for joining us. It's just great to be here. First of all, I love talking about Houston and about the uh, the nonprofit ecosystem in Houston, which is particularly strong. And I'm so delighted to have you both here to help guide us through this discussion. Steve, Andrea, thank you so much. Thank you very much for having us. We appreciate it. So I'm going to set this up and I'm gonna go over to you, Steve. Community Foundations, their, their objective is to connect donor investors to causes that they care about. And, and also you provide uh, stewardship of assets entrusted to the community foundation. You provide advice. You uh, try to connect the dots between those who require such investment and the investors themselves. And you've been working at, at it in Houston for 23 years. So you've seen a lot of change. Uh, talk a little bit about the arc of the community, the Houston Community Foundation, when you first came in, and where you are today, I, it's just such a fascinating story. We're actually one of the younger community foundations, and uh, I think we have kind of an unusual uh, creation story, if you will, uh, in that we were chartered in 1971 Ooh. under the Greater Houston Partnership. I think we were called the Chamber of Commerce at the time, as sort of a special purpose entity. Um, and used in kind of a, a narrow, as a narrow special funding vehicle for like the Houston Policeman's Memorial and special projects for uh, the Houston Independent School District. Uh, and then around 1990, there was a man named uh, Randall Meyer who um, served as chair of the Greater Houston Partnership and then became chair uh, of the Community Foundation under that umbrella. and. He convinced the board of the partnership that the community would be well served to have an independent community foundation, as cities did all over the United States. Um, and so that thus began the groundwork to have us spun off. Uh, and in 1995, Houston launched its own independent community foundation. Uh, when I joined in, in 2001, we had about $50 million of assets under management. Uh, today, last we looked, we were the 22nd largest community foundation in the country with about $1.3 billion of assets under management, primarily held here to be invested with other nonprofits uh, for the improvement of quality of life in the greater Houston community and beyond. But maybe more importantly, over our lifetime, we've given out $2.2 billion in grants uh, to other nonprofit organizations, including over $200 million last year. So we look at that grant number and we get really excited and proud of our donors that they're out there investing that level of uh, strategic philanthropic capital into the community. One of the things that I really love about this story is the intersectionality between the group on the one hand and individuals on the other, right? The, the impact that individuals can have. And that's so important in a community foundation's relationship with funders because basically you're functioning as a as a, a vehicle for uh, the sensibility of individuals, but also in relation to, to community need. Andrea, how do you see that, that dialogue evolving over your tenure, um, and particularly as you see it uh, evolving into the future? Yeah, you know, the philanthropic landscape is dynamic and it's ever-changing. Um, you've probably heard about the great wealth transfer. We're looking at $84 trillion being passed down from the silent generation and baby boomers to these next generations. So lots of things are changing, but so is philanthropy. And so as we work with individuals and families and even corporations, business leaders, privately held companies, we're seeing philanthropy change based on what their interest is, but also based on there's a desire from these younger generations. We like to call them the next gen or the rising gen, that whether they've inherited those dollars today or not, they are rolling up their sleeves and they're ready to make an impact today. 
They look at philanthropy different though. Mom and dad and grandparents, they're very loyal. They're very, they have legacy gifts. They have their religious entity. They have their alma mater and they might have two or three passion areas that they like to contribute to. So very predictable, very structured, very. right? There's this bucket, this bucket, this bucket. And how are you seeing that evolve with the younger generation? The, ne the next generations want to see impact. They want to say, I understand, mom, that you gave to this, but you know what? I really want to hone in and see impact. So let's take a look at instead of giving to 25 organizations, let's make smaller number of gifts, but larger gifts to specific areas. So maybe they're not gonna give to one entity that's been long and loyal, but they're looking at the 990s. They're looking at the impact that they have, the collaborations between the nonprofits to make sure that their dollar is gonna be used at the highest value. We have an amazing program that Steve um, can share more about, but it's called our Next Gen Institute, where we're actually partnering with these next generations to help arm them to understand philanthropy and make the impact that they want to have. Steve, why don't you take uh, take uh, on the cue uh, that Andrea gave you in terms of, of, of how you're actually shaping this facility to, to create a knowledge transfer, but that empowers donors to exploit their own sensibility as that knowledge is transferred from your folks uh, to these new generation philanthropists. Absolutely. This is a, a program that we've been working on for uh, over 10 years now, and it just aligns very much with our whole focus on um, you know, the strategic investment of philanthropic capital and this idea of impact. And so we know that um, you know many folks in the next generation are going to be well positioned. They're going to have significant financial resources, and as Andrea just said, you know they focus on data. Uh, they're all about technology. They want to have impact, um, and not that mom and dad didn't want to have impact, but they are like laser focused on it, and they really want to see you know proof of it, et cetera. And so they want learning and they want education. And so we've created this vehicle, this institute that has evolved over the 10 years uh, to be a really efficient learning mechanism. It went from, you know, a series of classes to now we do it over uh, a couple of weekends during the year so they can be, you know, really efficient, even live out of town and come in. And we teach them about how to identify highly effective nonprofits and effective social entrepreneurs and how you read financial statements and how you look for uh, impact and and an issue that, that always comes up among them. How do you say no uh, if someone asks you for an investment, which is always kind of fascinating? Um, and and how do you and and they learn together uh, because it's a really unique space to have the opportunity to, to make a difference in people's lives. And one of the other things uh, that's really interesting about the younger donors is that they want to come to the work humbly. By which I mean they really want community voice in this. Um, they don't want to just be, you know, handing the money out and down. They want to be involved in a partnership, learning about best practices, but also asking the people who are receiving the money, like what works and, and what's the best thing we can do and getting nonprofit leaders to partner uh, in that process. And so this is an institute to teach them about the best learnings in our field and to continue to update. And indeed, even when they graduate from the institute, they have a giving circle where they pull some money and they continue to learn together and they take that back to their their family donor advised fund, their family foundation. And they they were using that mechanism to educate a whole nother generation of givers. I'd like to get into two topics that, that you both raised. One is the issue of fewer and larger donations for impact. And the other is the question of impact itself. So let's talk a little bit about this whole idea of larger and fewer, because one of the things that that does happen is that if you are constantly investing in the largest organizations, the largest organizations, both in in uh, in business um, and in the nonprofit sector, the largest organizations aren't necessarily the most experimental and innovative mm -hmm. of them, right? You you always want to have this sort of leavening of new ideas, of 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 ideas that might be on the cusp, might fail, uh, but. Um, also is where you're reinventing the future, including in, in philanthropy or in, or in public service. How do you advise your donors 
to help them think about risk and reward and investing in perhaps a chance of failure, but a failure where you're failing up, where there are lessons learned. Steve, how do you get people to make that type of an investment? Well, you know, we sit down and we, it's a little bit like uh, helping someone invest uh, personal financial assets, right? You have this conversation around right. risk tolerance. Um, and almost everybody has what we call some some social uh, giving that they want to do, right? Like their their alma mater, their friends, charity, what have you, and you carve that out. That tends to be particularly for folks who are blessed with large amounts of resources, a fairly small part. And then you get into this conversation about what you just described. Do you want to be a giver who's willing to risk some capital? And a lot of the folks that we work with absolutely do. Um, and they might risk it on a startup uh, enterprise that has taken a really promising theory uh, that's different. And they're fine. And, and usually, by the way, Mark, one of the key things is they're fine with failing as long as it comes with learning. And they want to see that there are measures in place and documentation. So at the end of it, the capital may be gone and it didn't get to where everybody hoped it would. But there was something that was learned. So the next time it starts at a different place. And then there are some donors where that is really not their thing. And that's OK. And they steer away from that. So we have that conversation um, to the point Andrew was making before. I think younger donors tend to be more comfortable going down a riskier path with that. But we have plenty of older donors who are absolutely fine with looking at philanthropy as a place to take some more risk, particularly when you see that some of the more tried and true approaches have had um, more limited results with some of the more intractable problems within our society. Well, yeah, I love, can I add to that? So one of the things that I would say is that uh, a data-driven philanthropy is here and it's, it's something that our donors want regardless of their age. They want to understand what those issues are and how they can make an impact in that. So one of the resources um, that we've put together is called Understanding Houston. It's a strategic partnership with the Kinder Institute at Rice University, where we actually took a look at what are the quality of life issues here in Houston. Big picture, where you're looking at education or you're looking at health, and then you can take that and disaggregate the data and look at it very specifically to say, okay, I know that my dollar might not be able to solve every, every issue, complex issue with education, but if I narrow it down and say, I can focus in on this neighborhood, on this age of school, and provide um, X amount of dollars to help with literacy, I know I'm moving the needle. Um, let's, let's move on to impact. I'd like to get, get uh, back to another, uh, another issue that, that you prompted, Andrea, but, but let's stick, stick with you for now on the, on the question of impact. So there are, there's hard data, right? The number, it, for example, if you look at scholarships, right? Scholarship funding for schools, right? That's a number. You're, you're giving people the scholarships and then you look at graduation rates. That's really hard stuff. Now, if you talk about mental health or recovery from addiction, or you're talking about uh, children who are aging out of foster care or any of the, the other uh, issues, numbers don't tell the story because sometimes just helping one person to recover has such a huge impact, but it's one story, right, on a community. How do you deal with, uh, Andrea, this, this idea of sitting across from a donor and you're trying to help them navigate this question of impact, but it's a combination of hard data and soft data stories and that kind of kind of thing. How do you how do you work that information in a way that resonates with the donor and that is meaningful to the grantee? Yeah. There's a Mark, there's a reason why personal finance is called personal finance and philanthropy really is that intersection of the most vulnerable aspect that looks at their values and their passions and their experiences. So as we're working with donors, whether it be individuals or families or even corporations, we have to get to a place to understand what impact do they actually want to see happen? And how do we derive charitable solutions 
and grant making, high impact grant making that can make that desired impact. So we know that philanthropy is incredibly complex. If it was easy, all these issues would be solved, right? So a lot of times what we're seeing a new trend is, is a collaborative approach. They know that their dollars are only gonna get X amount. So we're able to convene and connect donors with other donors that are like-minded, that they can pool those investments together and actually tackle some of the more complexity to the societal issues that we see. So it's not necessarily disaggregating or, or not correlating those two things, but showcasing them a way to say, there is a way to make the impact that you wanna have and, and helping them come up with a solution to do that. Yeah, and we do actually- you find oh, that your good. board members accept the, the idea of a story sometimes being as powerful as a number? Yes, um, and, and I think to Andrea's point, it, whether it's a board member, a donor, it, it may be their individual perspective. Um, but I think most people want to see, it, it's really a question of emphasis. I think everybody wants to see both, right? They, mm -hmm. they want to know that the expense loads are appropriate um, and they want to see, you know, how many people are impacted, but the stories are powerful. And you made the point earlier, which I think is spot on, that it may depend on the type of issue that's being worked on. But I also think the other piece that can be very powerful here is that it's not about precision, it's often about trend. And if you start to see positive movement in something, even though you can't document exactly where it is on the continuum, I think that a lot of times that donors are very pleased with that and willing to invest more because they feel like they're moving the needle on some of these really long-term difficult problems uh, because they can begin to see, they see one story and then another, um, and they, they feel very good about that. And I think board members feel the same way when we look at the, the, the collaborative kind of giving that we're talking about and what Andrea was just talking about. We're actually launching a new initiative within the Community Foundation that's our strategic grant making piece. We're, we're gonna happen to focus our initial one on economic mobility, kind of multi-generational poverty. But what we're excited about is, and it's not replacing anything, it's in addition to what we've been doing, we're saying to our donors, you know, these problems are, are really difficult. And here's a place where you can come together with others and co-invest. And we're going to bring the best data and the best thinking and academia um, and other funders together. And we're going to go after this and see and other nonprofits. Right. This is, you know, there, there's no uh, uh, nobody's trying to own any space here. Right. We need everybody to come together um, to try and do this. And, and our goal is to bring our community of donors to this table to help add, uh, you know, some some uh, uh, financial resource and network and what have you um, to help make progress in these very difficult issues. So we're really excited about that work. Let me go where angels fear to tread for a bit, because in this country right now, we're we seem to have differences accentuated, I think, beyond any reasonable reality of difference, right? So when you're dealing with hard to, to address problems, these intractable issues, they're going to be strong feelings. And you happen to be um, advising donors who do have different sensibilities. And those donors might disagree with each other. They might disagree with their priorities, with, with, with a donor who's sitting right next to them, figuratively or literally. How do you navigate those those sensibilities? Is there is there acceptance in Houston that you're kind of a neutral playing field that respects different sensibilities and can advance simultaneously a a religious and a non-religious approach or a, a a this approach and a and a totally different approach to create independence and avoid codependence in in terms of solving social problems? Are you able to finesse? the political divisions that, that seem to afflict us and be, be trumpeted in the news and social media? Yeah, I, I only smile because I wouldn't claim that we uh, we have the magic bullet and, and it's easy. Well, if you did, I would ask you to instruct us all. So yeah, there you go. Your, but I, I will sit at your feet. But I will say this, and you kind of alluded to this um, uh, earlier, I believe, but I do think that most of the people who come to play in our sandbox um, care a lot about our community and they they care about opportunity. Um, everybody wants kids to succeed, right? And they want yeah. people to be healthy and they want people to be able to eat. 
And what we find is that sometimes it's as much a narrative and a language problem as it is anything else. And we want to get people talking to each other and around the table. And you're absolutely right. They may not agree on the solution and they may not agree, for example, how much of a solution should be government versus philanthropy or something. But if we can get everybody together, we can usually craft some effort, some experiment, some some work that we can all agree on and co-invest in and go try that as opposed to trying to, you know, be comprehensive and do everything because it's very hard to get buy-in on, you know, some very large solution. Um, and so that's kind of where we're at. And we think, we hope that, you know, one of the positive results that falls out of that is better dialogue. When I very first took this, this job, um, one rather prominent Houstonian said to me, you know, the community foundation is a place where you can bring people together. And when something goes off the rails in the community, there'll be more trust uh, to facilitate conversation. Well, people were a lot closer together then than they are now. So I think that role for the nonprofit sector in general is increasingly important. And that's what we're trying to do with this kind of work. And don't we have to give each other a break, Andrea? We have to basically maybe say, hey, maybe I don't have revealed wisdom. Maybe Steve or you, Andrea, or somebody else has knowledge that Mark doesn't have and maybe Mark should be listening, right? I absolutely agree with that approach. And I think that that's something that we do every day at the foundation is just meet that person, that individual, that company where they are because they've got experiences, they've got knowledge, they've got a voice to bring to the table. And it might not be the same view as somebody else they're sitting next to, but by golly, if we can get them to talk about it, like the, the, the conversations that we see and have with families, even families, it doesn't even have to be outside of like two neighbors, like it's within families and the generations see the world very differently, but it becomes robust and dynamic. And oftentimes there's, better solutions that come because they had a hard conversation versus just agreeing on something to agree on something and move past it to the next thing. Let's talk a little bit, and we're, we're coming to the end of our time. So let's talk a little bit about the power of convening and the power of dialogue. Uh, talk a little bit, Steve, about um, how you bring together disparate voices, disparate approaches, disparate uh, ways of thinking in a way that helps to cross fertilize ideas and perhaps come up with new solutions that each in their own silo wouldn't be coming coming up with. But that sort of soft element where it's not just about talking about one person's individual philanthropic stance, but instead is creating that cross fertilization that Andrea was talking about and developing new ideas that push you into the future that are constantly testing the limits of, of what we've learned in the past and developing new lessons for the future. Sure, absolutely. And again, you know, we have a number of families and donors we work with who really don't want to go there, and that's absolutely fine. And they do their own their own thing and their own philanthropy. For those who want to engage, for example, in our new, uh, uh, you know, community impact work, we'll bring them together. And the process generally starts with looking at the data and under and trying to get a common understanding of the problem, right? And usually you can get there because you, you have facts and you have the data and you're looking at, you know, how bad is the problem, who's impacted by the problem, et cetera. And then you try and bring in a number of different voices looking at, you know, what solutions have been tried, what what new things are being tried, what's worked in particular in other communities. And you know, this in our community, I, I assume this is true in other cities. We never accept that that what works somewhere else will work exactly the same here. We, we have to, as one of our donors says, Houstonize it, right? Um, but we try and bring in different ideas and then we have conversations around the donors because look, if the donors don't buy in, then, then we don't have the investment we need, right. financial and otherwise. And so that's where you, you're getting this buy-in where people are having really effective dialogue and they begin to realize they have a lot of shared values to go back to the conversation we were just having and they really want to make a difference. And then they get excited because they begin to believe that they can, because here are some ideas that, that are working. And so 
you know, it's not something that happens in 10 minutes. It happens over a longer period of time, but it's that dialogue and then it's setting up, um, you know, opportunities for investment and agreement on, all right, what, what's success going to look like? And again, back to what we talked about earlier, it might not work exactly as designed, but we're going to have some learning and we're going to try and make a difference. And we're going to make sure that we have, you know, community voice in this conversation. And we're going to try and keep this cohort together for some period of time. And all of a sudden, when people feel like they're really making a difference, they get excited and their differences tend to fall off to the side, at least for a period of time. Shared values, communication across boundaries, learning from each other, giving each other a break. May Houston light the world and light our way uh, toward that kind of unity in the United States so that we can solve our problems. Steve Maislin, President and CEO of the Greater Commun uh, Houston Community Foundation. Andrea Mays, uh, the Greater uh, Houston Community Foundation, Senior Director of Charitable Solutions. Thank you so much for sharing the wisdom and the work of the Greater Houston Community Foundation. It has been just a real pleasure. You, you need to come again so that we can check in with, with your progress um, on an annual basis. Thank you so much, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.